Blessed be the name of the Lord. Thank God for the privilege and the opportunity that we can come, come into his presence and partake of the communion. Hallelujah. We are truly thankful to Lord, the to Lord for all that he has done and all that he will continue to do. The Apostle Paul in the book of Corinthians as he addressed the the partaking of the communion, he went on to say that whosoever eat this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this reason, many are weak and sick among you, and many sleep. For if we would judge ourselves, we will not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened by the Lord, that we may not be condemned with the world. Praise the Lord. You know, when it comes to partaking of the Lord's table, Many people set different measures to say that if you are not baptized, you cannot partake of the communion. And as I thought about that, I realized that, you know, baptism don't save us. What saves us is the fact that we have repented of our sins, confessed Jesus as Lord over our lives, and have been forgiven by the Lord. Baptism, however, is a follow-up of that. Baptism is an open demonstration of what takes place inwardly. So, why should baptism hinder one from partaking of the Lord's Supper? And I think that we have put these kinds of stringent rules on people you know, and there are several others that I cannot speak of this morning. But I'm saying, we got to look at what the scripture says. The scripture says that you ought to examine yourself. If you know you are saved, you have given your life to the Lord genuinely, even though you are not baptized, you are qualified to partake of the communion. Because if you die now, and you have not been baptized, let me tell you, that will not hinder you from going to heaven. So I admonish you this morning, let us partake of the communion. Examine yourself, make sure you are not living in sin, you are not involved in sin. And uh, if you have to repent, repent, ask God for forgiveness. And partake of the communion. For the Bible says as often as we do this, we do show the Lord's death till he come. Let us pray this morning. Heavenly Father, eternal and righteous God, we come before you today. And we thank you, O oh God, for the privilege that we can come and uh, partake of the communion this morning. Lord, we thank you that it is not a ritual, but it is a spiritual exercise. Um, 
Lord, we are saying when we partake, we are saying, Lord, I identify with your death. I identify with your, your resurrection. I identify with what you did on the cross. And so today, oh God, we ask that you bless, Lord, the bread and the wine that as we partake, Lord, it will not just be emblems, but we partake of the blood and the body of our Lord. For you says, if we do not eat your flesh and drink your blood, we have no part with you. And so today, as we partake, Lord, we partake of oneness with you, O God. And so, Father, we give thanks and we give you praise in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. you peel off to get the, the wafer and then you break the lid and pull off the lid to get the wine all right so if you need help just raise your hand somebody will come and assist you um, I had some struggles with it um, finally I get the hang of it <laughs> Are we ready? For I have received from the Lord that which also I delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same manner also he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he come. Let us eat. And let us drink. Hallelujah, O oh Lord. Our oh, Father, we give you a praise. 
We give you worship, O oh Lord. Oh God, we honor you, O oh Lord, and we thank you for what you did on the cross. Took our sin, took our shame, took our sickness. Lord, you took everything that was wrong in us, oh God. You bore it on your body. Lord God, you paid the price. You went down to hell, suffered the claims of justice, rose, oh God, on the third day. Lord, hallelujah, you said all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. And so, Father, we say thank you, oh God, for that power that you give unto the church. Lord, so that we can exercise the right and the authority of the kingdom of God. And so, Father, this morning we declare, oh God, that sin will no longer reign in our body. Sin will not have dominion over us. My God, because we are overcomers today in the name of Jesus. Lord, we thank you, oh God, that sickness will not reign in our bodies. Therefore, we drive out every form of sickness. Lord, we drive it out from our bodies. Father, in the name of Jesus, every pain that has been lingering in our body, we drive it out in the name of Jesus. And my God, we thank you. We thank you, oh God, that by your stripes, we are healed. We are healed of every sickness, of every disease today, oh God. So, Father, we give you glory and honor. Lord, we give praise. We give thanks unto you. In Jesus' mighty name, amen, amen, amen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord.
thankful to you, O oh God, for the many blessings that you have bestowed upon us. We are so grateful to you, O oh God, for Lord blessing us and healing and healing and delivering us, O oh God. And so, Father, we count it a joy and a privilege to bring to you today, Lord, the gifts that we have received from you. Lord, we thank you, God, that you have given us health and strength and you have given us talents and giftings and abilities, oh God, so that we can earn today. And out of our substance, we bring to you to honor, honor you, oh God, and say thank you. Say thank you, oh God, for your blessings. We ask that you receive these gifts. And we know, as your word says, that you're going to bless your people abundantly. God, you're going to cause your blessings to come upon them and overtake them. We give you thanks today in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. You all may have your seats as we turn over to our moderator. So welcome, Brother Dennis, as he comes. Amen. Once more, let's give the Lord a big hand of praise this morning. Father, we thank you, O oh God, Father, for showing us your greatness. Oh, we bless your holy name. How great and awesome is he. Amen. Take every opportunity we have been presented in this life to recognize God is important. Sometimes we think that not much concentration takes place when we're doing our work and we are thinking about the things of God. But I tell you, some of the best revelations has come within that period. Sometimes you're driving. And whilst everything else is happening in front, you're slowing, you're you know, indicating and all this. Whilst you're praising God, it's like, like, you know, like heaven in the car something beautiful what about if we are in the depths of chaos and we step back from it all and say god we want to we want to acknowledge you in all that we say and do guide us through you see him there the psalmist has it clearly stated that whatever we go through he is with us. Amen. I just want to say this thing. I've never noticed this before, but there was a portion of scripture that I was reading, and it says about fine-tune your, your, your gifting in the sense of um, like the musicians. When the musicians were supposed to um, perform or I shouldn't say perform, but give their offering and praise and stuff like that. They spent a lot of time in preparation, in rehearsals. I want to thank the Lord this morning for all those who take time in whatever field of ministry that they are in, doing what they need to do to equip the saints for better service unto God. Amen. So I want to put my hands together, hand together for you as well. Amen. Before, I would like to um, call on Brother Jeremy this morning, and he is coming to minister in song. I look forward to this. Can we welcome Brother Jeremy as he comes this morning? Someone check. Good morning, everyone. Go okay. here. Someone check. Oh, that's much better. All right. Good. So the name of my song this morning is Be Magnified. You all may know it, so if you want to sing along, that's fine. If I hear you, that's nothing. Right? So, yeah. I hope you enjoy. And I'm blessed.
Amen. I'm going to head into some announcements and then we are going to um, invite our pastor on as he shares the word of God this morning. So we are having Sunday school this morning, starts back at 10. All are invited and welcome. Um, Tuesday at 7 on Facebook and YouTube, we have our online services. Um, service, Wednesday night prayer and Bible study on Zoom, 7 p.m. Friday family service on Facebook and YouTube at 7. And if there are other changes or announcements, Pastor will make them. I just needed to put that in. Can I invite you all to stand as we look to the Lord in prayer? You know, we should never be too tired, too, when we come before our God, eh? Yeah. So, dear Lord, I thank you for everyone that is here this morning. And I know in your word, you have great things in store for us. Guidance, direction, revelation. I pray, O oh God, Father, that we grasp, grasp it. We see it. We chew on it, O oh God, Father. We research it. And apply it in our lives. Dear God, strengthen our pastor as he comes this morning. I pray that your, that your word will be like a fresh in him, God, Father. He would be, Lord, willing as a servant to do your will and your bidding. Continue to mold and shape. Edify and quicken him, Lord, for your work. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's put our hands together and welcome our pastor this morning. Amen. Thank you, Brother Dennis. Praise the Lord. You all may be seated. Oh, glory to God. God is an awesome and mighty God. Amen. A lot of times, we go through certain experiences in our lives, and we should learn from them. Very rare, you know, do, do I get a, a stern check from the Holy Spirit. You know what I'm talking about? Like the Holy Spirit arrests you, call your attention and say, listen, no, that's not how it should be done. And um, I had a, a, um, an experience this week sometime, and the Holy Spirit had to do that to me. Now, when, when it comes to ministering to people, to reaching out to people, to going out to people, there is no limit. Let, let me explain what I mean by that. Sometimes, you know, it have people, they don't want to come to the Lord. They don't want to surrender to the Lord. But the moment they're in trouble, they call upon you. You go, you minister to them, you help them. Right? You restore them, they are good. They may come to church. But then they go back into the same behavior again. And, and it's a continual thing. And sometimes when, when we are faced with situations like, the, like this, with people, it kind of takes a toll on you. And you say, well, these people don't want to change. They only want you to come to them and come to their aid, but they don't want to change, they don't want to make a difference. You know, and, and you begin now to justify whether you should go or not. But as we look in the scripture, when it comes to ministry and ministering to people, there is no condition. We do not get to decide if they are worthy or not. We do not get to decide whether whether we should go because of their 
response. See, because you never know when your ministry will impact their lives and, and cause them to change. You never know that. And as we look at Jesus, Jesus went to everybody. The only person that Jesus, you know, um, I wouldn't say rejected, but told, I can't do what you're asking, is the Syrophoenician woman. And he said, you know, how can I take the, the children bread and give it to the dogs? And she responded by saying, well, the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. See? But other than that, Jesus reached out to people. The outcasts in society, he went to them. He ministered to them. How many of those people that got saved, uh, I'm sorry, got healed or delivered or, or, or Jesus ministered to them, how many of them actually followed Jesus? Do we know? We don't. And sometimes we, you know, we look at what's happening today and we see people come to the Lord and they get healed and then they go back out in the world. How many of those people in the Bible actually follow Jesus? You see, we don't, we don't know. So it is not our responsibility to determine when it comes to ministering to people whether they are worthy of ministering or not. It is not our call. Jesus says, go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. That is our responsibility. When we go preach the gospel, when we go pray for people, when we go minister to people, God does the rest. He does the work. The salvation of a soul is not up to you and I. It is up to Almighty God. The healing of an individual is not up to you and I. It is up to God. We have to do our part and God will do his part. Amen? And so as I thought about that this morning, you know, I thought about, you know, giving. When it comes to giving offering and stuff like that. And uh, I, I said, well, if, if this is the way in ministry, then giving has to be the same. But, but the Holy Spirit brought to mind Ananias and Sapphira. When they sold the land, when, when Ananias came to Peter and asked him how much he sold the land for, he said, um, Peter said to him, he said, why is it that you, you lied to the Holy Ghost? He said, before you sold it, it was yours. After you sold it, it was still yours. You had the right to give or to keep Whatever it is, why did you have the lie? If you wanted to give a part, come and say, listen, I am giving part. But don't lie to say that, okay, I sold the land and this is the sum. So when it comes to giving, you have a say in giving. So those are two different things altogether. When it comes to ministry, Jesus told the disciples, he said, freely you receive, freely give. That has to do with ministry, not material things. If you read the scripture, that has to do with ministry. Freely you have received from me, freely you give that. When it comes to finances, you have a choice. All right? So just in case uh, I, I, I confuse you a little bit, check it out in the scripture and you would realize we have to minister to people irregardless of their behavior. You see, how someone responds to the gospel does not determine whether we share the gospel or not. Our responsibility is to share the gospel. How they respond is up to them. At the end of the day, I could safely say, Lord, I give them your word. I spoke to them. I 
ministered to them. I prayed for them. I did my part. You see? So I just want to encourage you to ask the Lord. If you have ever found yourself in a situation like I did, just ask the Lord to forgive you and ask the Lord to make you more like him. Compassionate. To see the world through his eyes, not ours. Can I tell you, if we see the world through our eyes, there's a lot of people going to hell later. Because there's a lot of people we feel that they are not worthy. But at the end of the day, nobody is worthy. None of us were worthy. But yet God came to us. So pray and ask God to help you to be more like him. Would you be willing to pray that prayer with me right now? Father, this morning we come before you and Lord, we, we recognize uh, who you are and who we are. We are nothing without you, O oh God. All that we have and all that we are, it is because of you. And so we ask you this morning to make us more like you. Help us to be compassionate for the lost, for the dying, for the sick. Lord, for, for those that are abandoned, those that are homeless, Lord, jobless. Help us, O oh God, to be more compassionate. Help us, O oh God, to see them through your eyes. Not see their, their predicament and not see their, their unfortunate situations, but Lord, see that they need help. And help us, O oh God, to reach out to them. As Lord, when you looked at the city, you had compassion compassion upon them. I pray that you will help us to have compassion upon our brethren, have compassion upon our neighbors, our friends, our co-workers, our families, our relatives, our community, Lord, help us to have compassion for them, that we will reach out to them with the love of our God. Father, this morning as we are about to go to your word, I pray that you will give us wisdom and understanding. Help us to see things we have not seen before. Help us to understand things that we have not understood. Give us insight, O oh Father, in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Praise the Lord. Romans chapter 6, and uh, I want to read from verse 6. Praise the Lord. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin, for he who has died has been freed from sin. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we should also live with him. Knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body that you should obey it in its lust. Praise the Lord. Let me just stop here for now. The last time I spoke on this issue, I I spoke of a transformation that takes place. And uh, I spoke of the, the caterpillar turning into a butterfly. So the caterpillar goes through a stage of metamorphosis so that he is no longer a caterpillar but a butterfly. So is the Christian. 
We were all born in sin, shaped in iniquity. We lived in sin. We dabbled in sin. We enjoyed it. But then we came to Christ and we went through a change. This change is a spiritual change, one that we may not see outwardly. What we see is the effects of the change. So, my brother here used to drink a lot of rum and spend a lot of time in the, in the, the bar and come home drunk and stuff like that. Then when he met Christ, he went through a change. You don't see the change, but what you see is that the man stopped drinking. You see that the man stopped going to the bar. You see the effects of the change. And then you realize that something has happened to him. What I am seeing on the outside is a result of something that took place on the inside. So the change that we speak of is a spiritual change. I may look the same, dress the same, I will appear the same, but what happened is that if you really look closely, you will begin to see some changes. You will see some changes in my behavior. You will see some changes in my attitude. You will see some changes in my language and the way I speak. You will begin to see the changes. Now, you may not see all of the changes at once. But as I continue to serve the Lord, I continue to change. As I grow in the Lord and I develop in the Lord and I, I become more knowledgeable in the Lord, I begin to change. There are certain things that change. I, I got saved and, you know, there are many things that, that, that changed immediately. The visible things that you could have seen, that changed immediately. But it took me a while to deal with some things that you could not see. One such thing was anger. That is something you would not, if you look at me, you wouldn't see ang anger except I really get angry and you, you begin to see it in my expression. But anger is something that I had to deal with. And uh, uh, I didn't pay attention to it until one day something happened that, that, you know, kind of brought me to that place where I realized, hey, I need to deal with this. And I started to pray and ask God to help me to deal with anger. And, and I still get angry. Don't think I don't get angry. I still get angry. But my response to that anger is a different one. Because formerly, when I get angry, I would pelt things away. I would, you know, throw a fit. Now, when I get angry, I stay quiet. And I calm myself. And if I have to deal with a situation, I wait till I am I'm calm to deal with that situation. I try my best not to deal with anything when I am angry. Because when I'm angry, I may say the wrong thing and I may act the wrong way and... And the result uh, could be catastrophic. So the changes that took place in me, it happened over a period of time. I have been serving the Lord now for um, 40 years or so. <laughs> I, <laughs> I do lose track as to how much because I don't really keep, you know, tag of how many years. But, but in this 40 or 41 years as it may be, uh, I have gone through many changes. And I want to tell you, I am still changing. I am still changing. There are things that I used to think and now I am more knowledgeable and I realize, hey, you know what? No, there's a different way. There's a different uh, approach to that. 
And so I am learning to change my attitude still. I'm learning to change my behavior. I'm learning to change how I approach things. Uh, why? Because uh, the change is a progressive change, uh, not an instantaneous change. You see, people who believe in that instantaneous change, uh, they believe uh, once you are saved, uh, you, you remain saved no matter what you do. And so, you can go back out in the world and drink, and you can go back out in the world and, and live like you used to do, you are still saved. Let me tell you, that is not consistent with Scripture. The Scripture talk about backsliding. It talk about going back like a dog, going back to its vomit. You see, so, so there are many schools of thought where that is concerned. But when you come to Christ... He, 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 he changes you spiritually on, on the inside. Your spirit is renewed. But what happened, the changes that people see are outwardly. It has to do with our body. It has to do with our, 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 our mind. It has to do with our attitude. And, and so as we see in the scripture, the scripture makes reference to the body of sin. Right? If we go back up to verse 6, it says, Knowing this, that our old man is crucified. Now, we have talked about the old man and the new man. What does it mean that the old man is crucified? It means that the old way of thinking and living and all of that is dead. On the inside, that man is dead. The person that, that you used to go out partying and drinking and cussing people and want to fight and stuff like that, that man died. That man was crucified with Christ. Now, now it might be a little bit puzzling to know and to try to understand that, seeing that, that Christ was crucified, crucified uh, 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 almost more than 2,000 years ago, and um, you and I are not that old. So how is that possible? What happens is when we come and we identify with Christ, uh, we identify with what he did on the cross. We identify with his death, his burial, and his resurrection. That is what baptism is all about. So the Bible says that we, even though it, it may happen today, we are crucified with Christ. That old man is crucified with Christ. Now, let me see how I could illustrate this as best as, uh, you know, I, I don't have props, but let me try and illustrate as best as possible. You know that we are spirit, so let's say this is the spirit. The spirit lives in a, a body. So before we came to Christ, spirit and body functioned together in all the melee and all the mess and, and all the sin and everything. They, they together, they, do, they, they function together. But when we come to Christ, Christ renews the spirit. He changed the spirit. The Bible says we are renewed. That's what born again is. Spirit man being renewed. But he still lives in this body. So the old man that was there is crucified. But he's still living in this body. Now this body is accustomed to what it grew up with. Now you are saved, but how many you, you remember practicing obia? All right, how many of you remember drinking alcohol? One of the more common things. Cussing people. Wanting to fight. 
being unreasonable and things like that this fellow here he remembers all those things and uh, he will play it calm but if you push him and back him up against a wall like a cat he's gonna respond how many of you know that and that is why we find it difficult sometimes when we hear a Christian person does something we are like oh and all the time I thought they were saved <laughs> now the person didn't get unsaved you know it's just that some situation or somebody backed them up against a wall and that seemed to be the only way that they could have responded. Notice I said seem. Because at the moment they didn't think, well, let me pray and put this in the hand of the Lord. At that moment, they didn't think that the Bible says, vengeance is mine, I will repay. At that moment, they saw, as we say, water more than flour. And so, if you push me, I'm going to push back. So they reach a place where they resorted to verbal abuse, cursing, violence maybe, or resorted to something that this guy here did not agree with. Because while they were doing that, this guy was saying, hey, calm yourself, calm yourself. Uh, Let's not do it that way. Because the Bible says that, that there is a struggle between him and him. There is a fight. There is a war that goes on between these two guys. He wants to go one way to serve the Lord. And hope and expect that he is going to follow. But what happened in most cases is this guy decide, I am going in a particular direction and you have to come with me. Are you seeing the confusion here? So when this fella get enraged and he decide, listen, I am going to respond in vengeance uh, 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 with violence and take vengeance. I'm going to respond that way. The most he could do is say, fella, calm yourself. You know. Don't go that way. But when he decide to move, no matter how much he shout and talk, this fella wins in the end because he responds the flesh the body of sin and that's why it is important that we feed this guy spiritual things we feed him with the word of god we allow this guy to motivate, motivate that guy to pray. How many times you find that this guy want to pray and that guy say, uh, uh, uh. There's a show going on on TV. And I don't want to miss it. There is something happening and I want to be a part of that. And what we find happening 
is that this guy is trying to bring this guy under subjection by the word of God. But if he does not submit, he becomes helpless. As much as he wants spiritual things, if this guy decides to go after fleshy things, we are in a quandary. But Paul addressed that issue by saying, knowing this, that this old guy who used to go after those things, he is dead, he's crucified. That the body of sin might be done away with. Now I want you to watch what the scripture is saying. Eh? It is the hope that this guy with the new transformation and newfound life in Christ with growth and development will change this guy gradually. So that certain things that he still want to will fall off. I remember when I got saved. Like I said, a lot of things that I used to do, it fell off naturally. I, I didn't have a problem with, with smoking. I didn't have a problem with drinking alcohol. I didn't have a problem with cussing. I didn't have a problem with liming. I, there's many things that I used to do. I, I, I mean, I never go, went after marijuana anymore. I, I, I never did a lot of these things. But you see the secret sin? It was still there. I love to look at the ladies. And so I and a Christian brother, we were traveling in a taxi one day and we were going to San Fernando. And there was this young lady on the road. And as the car passed, I looked and my head turned. And the guy took notice of it. And he said to me, he said, you still haven't gotten over that area of your life, huh? And I can't remember what I said to him. I probably asked him to pray for me or something like that. But I did admit that that was an area I didn't get over with. So while this guy had molded this guy to some extent, there were some things that he still held on to. That he had to let go. He had to bring this guy under subjection. And let me tell you, over the years that I have grown, where this guy doesn't lead anymore. Well, maybe sometimes. I, I must admit that because I'm not perfect. I'm not saying that as an excuse, I'm just being honest. But this guy is in control most of the time. Now that didn't happen overnight. That happened over a period of time of learning. Many times I make mistakes. Many times I give in to this guy. Many times I surrender and, and allow him to go. And then now he has to come and repent. Because he didn't stop him. And I am sure you can identify with me that you have made some mistakes as well and have to come and repent after. And, and, and it's not mistakes that you did not know about, you know. You just wasn't strong enough. You allow this guy to lead. And so you and I have to ask ourselves, who is leading in our lives? 
especially when we face conflict, especially when we face uh, having to make uh, decisions, uh, uh, impacting decisions in our lives for ourselves or for our family. Who is leading? Is it the spirit man or the, the body of sin? And in most cases, we give way and surrender to him. But we have to take back the reins. This guy had to be a little more stern. He had to make a decision and says, listen, we're going to pray and we're going to read the Bible now and forget the TV. Because the TV... Is, the television is not going to help you. It's not going to, to, to make you better. The television is just uh, allowing you to waste some valuable time. Here is an excuse that we all have. I didn't have time. Examine that. Is that really true? Is that really a true statement to say, I did not have time? You're supposed to discipline yourself. You see? And, and we use that excuse to say that I didn't have time. It's not that you did not have time. You did not make time. You did not order time. You did not set aside or manage your time. I'm talking from experience. And this is a problem that we all have. And it is because we have not managed our time, that guy get away with a lot of stuff. He does a lot of things that we shouldn't do because we did not manage our time. But the Bible says that that man was crucified so that this guy might be done away with. The control that this guy have might be done away with. How long have you been serving the Lord? Flesh, spirit. Are we there? Are we there? Are we there? Or are we like this? Who is in control? See? And so a lot of problems that we face, a lot of problems that we encounter is because we allow this guy to rise. We allow him to have his way. Like a little kid, when a kid throw a, temp a temper tantrum, what most people do, because they are ashamed, they, they allow the, the child to have their way. As I said that, some things come back to mind that I did. I wouldn't tell you. <laughs> but, but let me tell you, you have to discipline them. If I go in the grocery with my child, and my child wants something, and I said, no, you can't have, and they start a rolling the ground, I leave them, let her roll. And take my trolley and go down there, they bong to come and find me. But you see, too, too many of you are too, too sophisticated. You don't want people to see your child behaving like that. You want to be the, the, the proper parent. If they have no proper parent, that's only a facade. Those same people who you don't want to know, you think their children don't behave so too? 
So we have given control. Let me tell you, anytime your child throws a tantrum for something that you said that they can't have and you give in to that, you know what you just did? You gave that child control. And you do that a few times and you realize you would come to a place that you can't tell them anything anymore. Have you ever heard a child die from crying? Huh? You see, when they are, ba they are a baby and they cry, sometimes you don't know what they're crying for. And as a baby, you think it's food and you give them food. And they're still crying. You clean the diaper and they're still crying. And you don't know what. Sometimes you take them up and you hug them a little bit. You know, and they stop crying. You know what it is they want? They want a little warm and comfort from you. See? But if we allow the children to have control, then we are at a loss. And that's why many children grow up in families where the parents can't even tell them anything. And I'm talking about teenagers and under 18, you know. Some between the ages of 9 to 12 and 13. And parents can't tell them anything. Listen. We cook, we cook spinach. And you don't want to eat spinach? That's you. Sit down there with the spinach and roti and watch it. Ask my son. He will tell you. <laughs> See? So they know about this. We have to... We have to be in control. So the spirit man has to be in control. He doesn't get to say what he want, when he want, and why he want. You know why prayer meeting and Bible study, even though it's on Zoom, you know why it only have a few people? Because this guy don't want to pray. And many have allowed this guy to take control. So when prayer meeting going on, they sit down in front of the television and they're watching some show going on on television. Why? Because that guy lost out. Say amen. amen. Listen, you all don't see me on Zoom, but I'll just be there. Ask Rishi. Rishi can tell you. There are times I will, I will, I will um, pop in to make a comment. Or sometimes you might call my wife to pray and she's away and I will take the phone and pray. See? But I can tell you who is on prayer meeting, who is on Zoom and who is not on Zoom. Some of you have never been on Zoom. And I can tell you who. And so you can use the excuses, but you can't fool me. Ask yourself, don't answer to me, but ask yourself, what will it cost you to spend one hour on a Wednesday night on Zoom in prayer and Bible study? What will it cost you? What will it take away? How will your life diminish by doing that? And if you have a very good answer, come tell me. See? But we have allowed this guy to run away with us. The body of sin. Watch what the scripture says. That man was crucified with Christ. 
so that he does not be in control. That we, meaning him, should no longer be a slave to sin. Let me tell you, if you are a slave to sin, that's God's fault. Learn to love this guy. Strengthen him. Feed him. Let him receive from God, not, not him. When he wants to receive from God, you know what you do? He looking for a sign. Hear how he is operating. When he wants direction from God, he said, God, I'm going out today. And if it's your will, make this happen. See? But this guy on the other hand, he said, Lord, guide me. Speak to me. Open my eyes to see. Show me. So that whatever I do will be done according to your will. Lord, I am going out today and I am trusting you. You lead, you guide, I will follow. That's how that guy operates. See? So when this one looking for signs and wonders and looking for Signs of the zodiac and whatever and, and stuff like that. And looking for those things to lead him. This guy is saying, God, you lead me. You are my God. God does not want us to be slaves to sin. We were that once. We were bound by sin. God took us out of that. You want to go back to that? You want to go back to the old way of life and old behavior and stuff? No, come out of that. God take you out of that. Stay clean and free from sin. And let me tell you, your life is going to be better. Amen? Praise the Lord. I think I went over. I don't know. <laughs> Let us pray this morning. Our Father, we come before you in the name of Jesus and we, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the wisdom and the understanding that we receive. We thank you for the enlightenment, O oh God. And I pray, O oh Father, that you will help us. Help us, O oh God, not, O oh Lord, not to allow the flesh to lead, not to allow the body of sin to lead, but help us, as the apostle said, help us to bring our body under subjection, bring it to a place of submission, Lord, that the body will follow the leading of the Spirit. I pray, oh God, that uh, those areas in our lives that need cutting and trimming and shaping, Lord, you, oh God, cut and shape. Oh Lord, we, oh God, are the clay, but you are the Potter, O oh Lord, mold us uh, and shape us uh, and make us what you want us to be, Lord, so that we will be living creatures, uh, Lord God, that will bring glory and honor unto your name. Uh, oh, Father, this morning we break down the barriers and the strongholds. Uh, Lord, we pull down the thoughts uh, and the imagination, uh, Lord, and every high thing that exists exalts itself uh, above the knowledge of God. We pull it down uh, in the name of Jesus. We destroy the work of the enemy. And Father, we pray, oh God, uh, that you will minister in and through us uh, as we give you glory and honor. And Lord, we give you praise today. Lord, I ask that you have your way, Father, in Jesus' mighty and precious name. Amen. And amen. Praise the Lord. Go out this week 
and suffer that guy. Feed that guy some good stuff. Amen. It was good having you here this morning. God bless you. I trust that you have been blessed by this word. Please share it with somebody. Amen. So that they too can be blessed. God bless you. And we look forward to uh, our Tuesday night um, service. Amen. God bless you.